Recently, we featured T.J. McConnell here on Fresh 24. Now, we feature Nick Stauskas, T.J.'s good friend. How good? The most underrated Sixers player ever. Ooh. T.J. McConnell? Favorite Sixers teammate ever. T.J. McConnell. Funniest Sixers teammate you ever had. T.J. McConnell. <laughs> There's a theme here. We'll hit on a number of themes, including the process, with former Sixer Nick Stauskas. Next on Fresh 24. Now Covington for three. Oh, and there's Stauskas to throw it down. Hold me back, fam. <laughs> Six is locked, all windows and doors. Nicholas, Tomas, Thomas, Tomas, Stauskas, Canadian, Lithuanian heritage, eight years in the NBA, two with the Sixers, honing in on 30, Sauce Castillo. Brother, what's going on? Not much, just living the dream. Excited to, uh, to be chopping it up with you. It's been a minute, Mark. I'm excited to, uh, to be here today. It's been a minute, and you did live the dream. You played basketball and got paid to play, but you're not anymore. People would naturally expect at 30 that you would still be playing. Why aren't you? That's a very interesting question. Um, I, I would say a number of things played into that decision, but basically in the 2021-22 season, I was playing in the G League, got called up by the Celtics. We went to the finals and uh, you know, lost to that Warriors team. And I was on a two-year deal. deal I was on a two-year deal with the Celtics. The second year being um, a team option. So you know, my goal was just you know do everything I could, everything in my power to have them bring me back for a second year. And that summer, they ended up trading me to Indiana for uh, Malcolm Brogdon. And so. While the trade happened, um, in order for the trade to go through and like the salaries to match up, the Pacers had to pick up my team option, which was great. But, you know, Boston sent like five players to Indiana. Indiana sent one player to Boston. So Indiana just didn't have the roster space to keep all of us. And so they ended up waiving me. Um, and while, you know, the salary was guaranteed, I was now a free agent again. And so I had just kind of like, done the Euro league thing, G league. And like, you know, I had really put myself through a lot to get back to the NBA and, um, just the timing of it all. My daughter was born in September, uh, September 12th of 2022. And as you know, that's typically when teams are starting to, you know, gear up for training camp and preseason and whatnot. And I was ready to go. Um, but I told my agent, I said, look, I, you know, if I'm going to leave my wife and my newborn baby, um, it's, it's got to be for something that's, you know, that's real, something that I'm going to be actually, you know, a team that believes in me and, and wants to give me a chance because, you know, I had been on this roller coaster where, you know, team after team, year after year, you know, moving different places. And, you know, once you have a wife and kid, it's, it's not as easy as just like picking up your bags and then going to the next spot. And so, um, I just told him, I said, look, I'm, I'm ready to keep going. I'm ready to, to, to head out anywhere, but you have to tell me that it's a legit chance. Like they're not going to just send me back down to the G league or whatever. And when it came down to it, I, I just, I didn't have a clear path to making a roster in training camp. And for me, I just, you know, I just wasn't willing to go back down to that G league route. Like I had done it the previous year in my final two games in the G league. Like I had, 57 and 43 in you know in a 24 hour span and just felt like I had shown that I you know can I belong at, in the NBA level and so approaching 29 years old like I was just realistic with myself and I said man 
like I am what I am at this point, you know, like what they saw for me last year in that G uh, throughout the G league and throughout the NBA season, like that's, that's who I am. And there's no, all, there's no switch that I'm going to flip. That's all of a sudden going to turn me into this like reinvented new player. And so I kind of just came to grips with the fact that like, look, if I want to continue playing basketball, it's going to be a lot more of, you know, this team to team, city to city, country to country, maybe, and um, after doing it for eight years, nine years, I just, it just wasn't something that interested me anymore. Like I always, you know, I always told my wife that once we had kids, I wanted to be there and not always be on the go. And I didn't want to start my daughter's life in a way where it was just constant chaos and stress. So, you know, I made that decision to, to peacefully walk away from the game, but uh, it's a little bit maddening only because, you know, again, my last year playing professional basketball in the G league again with the Celtics, in some ways I felt like I was the best I've ever been, um, you know, shooting the ball, you know, well over 40% that year. Um, my body was, my body was holding up pretty well. Um, you know, just the, the, it was really that thing, you know, a lot of people say 28 to 32, you kind of hit that prime where it's the mind and body kind of, they hit that peak where the two are very connected. And that's how, that's how I felt in that last season. So uh, it was hard for me to walk away knowing that I could still very much play at that level. But um, I also knew that it wasn't something that was going to bring me and my family the most happiness. So um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I made the decision to step away. By the way, uh, we're going to talk plenty of hoops. We're going to talk about your time with the Sixers. I just wanted to add that you dropped, yeah, 57 in a G League game. You had 11 threes. The next night you had 43, a total of 100, and that came on the anniversary of Wilt scoring 100 in a game. But uh, to me, that, that that's crazy. Uh, we recently had your boy TJ McConnell on, and he said mm -hmm. uh, at the time that you and your wife were going to visit, did you uh, eventually do that? Um, no, so he actually, he actually came to visit us. Um, oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, well, you know, TJ's a big soccer guy, and so he – he came to Philly. He drove from Pittsburgh to Philly and then, um, uh, him, him and I, and then one of our friends, we took a, uh, we took like a sprinter van down to New York and we went to go see the Manchester United versus Arsenal game, um, at MetLife stadium, which was, I'm not a soccer guy. It was an awesome atmosphere. Yeah. And I couldn't believe that that was just like an exhibition match, you know, like, wasn't even anything, you know, that they're really playing for because the energy and just the whole atmosphere of the building was, um, you know, it was phenomenal. So TJ has been trying to convert me to, to be a soccer fan. Um, it's a great was, sport by the way. And, and he's got an interest in Leeds United, right? Yes, he does. He's now, yeah. um, you know, part owner of the team and it's crazy. Like when I was playing with TJ, he, I'd never heard him talk about soccer and now it's it's all he talks about. He's so passionate about it. He loves watching. He loves following it. So, um, you know, I can see why, though. The games are definitely a lot of fun to to go to. So uh, growing up in Canada, you didn't play soccer. And to a lot of people's surprise, I guess, you really didn't play hockey that much. Why basketball? Um, I was really – I was playing soccer when I was, uh, you know, five or six years old. And um, – I thought that was going to be my thing. I liked it mm. a lot. And then I was playing in a game one day and bam, someone tripped me. I fell and I broke my arm when I fell. And, you know, being a five, six year old kid, I got it in my head that um, soccer was bad luck and that I was going to get hurt if I played again. So I, you know, had to switch it up. And um, at the time I was like pretty, I was pretty tall for my age. And my uncle was the coach of a Lithuanian um, church league team for um you know this basketball league and uh he's like oh, why don't you come join our team you're gonna be one of like the taller guys and i had never played before never touched basketball but i showed up to like the first practice and i was just kind of like naturally had a feel for it um and hmm. it was just a vicious cycle where the more i played the better i got and the better i got the more i wanted to play and um it kind of spiraled from there and you got so good, you eventually went to prep school in the U.S. and you became a high school star and heavily recruited. 
Is it true that Jay Wright and Villanova recruited you and were uh, the Wildcats even a possibility at that point? So the interesting thing about Villanova, which by the way, I'm, I'm like a eight minute drive. I live like maybe eight minutes away from, from Villanova. Mm. Um, the crazy thing is that Villanova is the only other school that I visited other than Michigan. Mm. I didn't visit anywhere mm. else, but at the same time, they never really like heavily recruited me. Um, you know, I remember we, maybe when I was like 15 years old, we had a, a tournament here in the Philly area, my, my Canadian AAU team. And, um, after one of our games, our coach took our whole team, um, you know, to meet Jay Wright and to kind of take a tour of their facilities. And so, I mean, there was a little bit of interest, but I wouldn't say they were ever like, you know, seriously recruiting me. Um, for me, my, my, my main two schools I was really deciding between were Michigan and Iowa state. Uh, Fred Hoiberg at Iowa state was one of the guys that, um, I had a really good relationship with. So, um, those are, I would say those were like the main two for me. So you go to Michigan, you play under a great coach in John Beeline, you lose to Louisville in the NCAA title game. I'm talking about 2013. You were there for two years. Mm -hmm. Trey Burke, Tim Hardaway Jr., Glenn Robinson III, Mitch McGarry, Karis LeVert, and you, all NBA players. What a squad. Why isn't it that you – and listen, that Louisville team is great. Uh, what kept you from winning it all? The last – Two minutes of the first half was the hmm. absolute, you know, it was the difference in the game. Um, so most people, if you remember that game, Trey Burke picked up two fouls in the first three minutes of the game. And Coach Beeline has a rule. If you pick up two fouls in the first half, you don't play again until the second you half. You don't play for the rest of the half? He's yeah, a lot right. of coaches will do and, that. And so it's national championship game, and he picks up his second foul. We're all looking like there's no way – He's taken Trey. Out. <laughs> right. Like, it, you know, he was he's like, got, wasn't he national player of the year? He was national, was he national player, player of the year. And, yeah. And you can go back and watch the film. In the first three minutes of the game, Trey had our first seven points, came out wow. firing. And I was like, mm. oh, he's leading us to the national. It's just, it's a done mm -hmm. deal. He picked up mm -hmm. the second foul. Coach Beeline sits him down and puts in, at the time, my roommate and, you know, goes on to be the groomsman of my wedding, Spike Albrecht. And, Spike ended up becoming a little bit of an overnight celebrity because he comes in the game and goes for 17 in the first half and just absolute, just torturing uh, Peyton Siva, Russ Smith, and all the Louisville guards, just kind of getting to wherever he wants. And we had a comfortable, you know, 9, 10, 11 point lead with like two minutes left. And then Luke Hancock from Louisville um he closed out the half the last four louisville possessions he hit four consecutive threes and we went into halftime maybe up one or two um and the momentum had just completely shifted and when we came out in that second half it was you know battle back and forth but we ended up losing by like four or five points or whatever it was so um that was a tough one though because it definitely felt like for that for the majority of that first half that we had complete control but um, basketball is a game of runs for sure. How'd you make it work with a team like that? Everybody was a bona fide score. How were you able to work it out that you had really good chemistry? Well, I think coach Beeline, uh, he just did a, he had, he did a phenomenal job with our offense. Um, we, we weren't, a, we were an okay defensive team. We were nothing special, but my God, we could score the ball with the best of them. And, um, with Trey kind of leading the way he was an Allen Iverson type of point guard where, you know, he's going to go and get buckets, but, you know, he also did a good job of like, you know, coming off a of pick and roll and like hitting the guy shaking up on the wing for three or, you know, in the pick and roll, you know, throwing a lob to one of the bigs. And so there was a good amount of ball movement. And it was one of those things too, where we had so many, you know, guard wing type players where it's like. If you go get a rebound, if I get a rebound or Tim gets a rebound, you know, Karis, we all just, we, we're out and we're running. And then mm -hmm. everyone's running their lanes and, you know, just playing basketball together and making the right reads. Um, and Coach Beeline was big on watching film every single day. So, you know, making the right read was something that, you know, we took a lot of pride in and playing the right way. Um, and it was fun, you know, sharing the ball and seeing everyone succeed and winning 
you know, that that's, mm. that's ultimately the goal. And it's, it's fun when that's all clicking. So with that team, um, definitely it, it felt effortless for us to kind of go through those things where, you know, you kind of con- uh, contrast that with, you know, some other teams that I've played for uh, throughout my professional career. And it's, you know, it's, you know, when, once you start comparing those, you're like, damn, that, I don't know if I've ever had as much fun playing basketball as I did with, with that Michigan team. Coach Beeline had a brief stint with the Cleveland Cavaliers and as great as he was in the college level, just couldn't make it work in the NBA. I imagine it's a very difficult transition. Do you ever have a conversation with him about that transition? For sure. Um, I actually went back to Ann Arbor. after. What did he tell you? What did he tell you? Well, what did he say about the experience or what did Mm -hmm. he say? Yeah. You know, about the transition to the NBA from the college ranks. I warned him ahead of time because uh, believe it or not, I was on the Cleveland Cavaliers right before he got hired. And so during 2018, 2019 season, during our exit interviews, uh, Larry Drew was the coach at that time. He resigned. They were looking for a new coach. And they asked me in my exit interview, what do you think about Coach Beeline? Would he be able to coach this team? And I was like, obviously, love the guy, great coach, phenomenal with the X's and O's. But um, having seen what I, you know, a number of things in the NBA, whether it be my time with the Sixers or with that Cleveland team, which was very, very bad, by the way, that Cleveland team mm-hmm. was post LeBron horrendous. Um, I just knew it was going to be difficult for him to implement the same things that he was implementing at Michigan because it required people to fully buy into like his way. And as you know, in the NBA, it's not always the coach doesn't have that much control over who he's getting on the roster and what type of character they have and like what kind of family are they from and, you know, do they play the right way? Coach Beeline was great at Michigan because he was handpicking his players that he knew would fit into his system. And when he came into Cleveland, while they had some very talented players, they weren't necessarily players that were going to fit into what he was looking to do. And so I warned him ahead of time because my, after my rookie year with the Kings, I went back to Ann Arbor that summer and we sat down, we had lunch together. And I remember then he told me, I want to make the jump to the NBA. Like I want to find a coaching job in the NBA. And I had just finished playing for the Kings my rookie year where we had three coaches in one year and it was chaos Mm -hmm. at all times, like behind the scenes in the locker room, chaos. And so I was like, coach, it's different. Like it's very, very different than what you have going on here at Michigan. So if you're going to do it, you have to be willing to make some adjustments. And, um, you know, ultimately I think, first of all, he, I don't think he was really given a fair shot in Cleveland. Like they signed him to a five-year deal and he, they gave him like four months and granted that team, like no matter who you put in as their coach, they weren't winning. They weren't going to win that year. So, um, I just feel like they took the easy way out. And, you know, there was a lot of like reports about things that were said in film rooms and rumors and this and that, and, you know, guys talking to the media behind his back. And it was, it was messy. And I feel for him because in some ways it was like, uh, it kind of is like tainted his like image as a head coach because everywhere he everywhere else he's been he's been super super successful and then he has this one stint which is his last stint and it's just it was kind of ugly so Mm. I feel for him but I feel like it shouldn't be you know reflected as to like the kind of coach he is because he's phenomenal um especially with the X's and O's one of the best in the business and I I just wish he got a a more, more of a fair shot with that team All right, Nick, so we're going to talk about your NBA career and your time with the Sixers and the origin of Sauce Castillo. Mm -hmm. But first, it is time for our halftime segment. We call it This or That. It's a six-pack. You have to choose between two things. Are you ready? Don't think about it. Just do it, brother. Here you go. NBA fans, the wait is over. Basketball is back, and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA, is celebrating with an unbeatable offer. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets for throwing down $5 on the NBA. Win or lose, it doesn't matter. You'll start the season with an instant dub. 
And with DraftKings parlays, everyone's got a shot at even bigger basketball wins. String together multiple bets from the same game or build your parlay across multiple games for a shot at making your payday even sweeter. Basketball's more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code ZOOMOFF. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code ZOOMOFF. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, licensee partner Golden Nugget Lake Charles, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball. Terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions. Terms and responsible gaming resources. Check out our friends over at Philadelphia Sports Nation, a local Philadelphia sports site covering your favorite teams across blogs and social media. PHLSportsNation.com. Philadelphia Sports Nation. PHL Sports Nation. Enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience. Philly cheesesteak or Philly soft pretzel? Cheesesteak. Center City or South Jersey? Center City. Gritty or Philly Fanatic? Gritty. Meek Mill or Hall and Oates? Meek Mill. Dr. J, Sixers Era, Sixers Era Throwback or Allen Iverson, Sixers Era Throwback? Allen Iverson. Liberty Bell or Rocky Steps? Liberty Bell. All right. Now I want you to fill in the blank. Are you ready? Another ready. six pack. Here you go. Best restaurant in Philly is. Uh, Vernick Fish. Favorite Philly hangout spot is? Mm, Rittenhouse Square. Best heckle you ever heard from a Sixers fan, whether to you or an opponent? Um, the guy that uh, gave Westbrook the finger right, right into his face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to reenact that, but I know what you're talking. It's like a meme. It's iconic. The most uh, underrated Sixers play. The most underrated Sixers player ever. Ooh. TJ McConnell. Favorite Sixers teammate ever. TJ McConnell. Funniest Sixers teammate you ever had. TJ McConnell. <laughs> There's a theme here. All right, it's time for me now to give you a handful of artists from my music library, and you tell me if you have them in your library. Are you ready? Sounds good. Here we go. Biggie. Biggie Smalls. I got Biggie. it. Biggie. Tears for Fears. Nope. <laughs> Stevie Wonder. Nope. Wow. DJ Khaled. Yep. Fallout Boy. Yep. Here you go. Do you, who do you listen to on a regular basis? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, you know, whoever's popular, Drake, Bieber, um, you know, I guess – I, a little bit of hip hop, a little bit of pop, you know, whatever's on the radio these days typically is, is okay with me. So you just named a couple of Canadian guys. You ever get together with them? I wish I I've met Drake before, but I like Bieber has been number one on my list for so long and I just have never had the chance to meet him. Okay. About 10 years ago, you're getting ready for the NBA draft after two years at Michigan. You post a video from college. You're in your parents' backyard in Ontario draining like 70 of 76 threes. And who puts it up there but Steph Curry? And it becomes viral 
when he did that. And I don't know, there was even talk about you and Steph <laughs> getting together for a three point shooting contest. I don't know. Put that in perspective, whatever became of that. It was, it was so crazy. It was just so, it was a, it was a weird time because I, we posted the video, not expecting anything of it. And I remember I went to sleep that night you know, the video had maybe a thousand views or whatever, nothing crazy. And I woke up the next morning and my, my phone had like a thousand notifications on it from Twitter, text messages, and every notification had Steph Curry's name in it. And I was like, what did, what did Steph do last night? Cause it was, it was, <laughs> time. what did right. Steph do last night? And then I go on and I saw he responded to my video and then he was like three point shootout sometime question mark. And I was like, oh man, this is, this is phenomenal. Especially because at that time I was starting to, you know, really try to emulate Steph and, and be like him. And he was kind of right on that, you know, horizon where he started to become one of the best players in the league. And so, um, we actually had things in place for him to come to my backyard and do a three point shootout. Um, and TSN, the Toronto sports network was going to broadcast it. And basically what happened was the NCAA stepped in and they said, we weren't allowed to do it because it was like professional versus amateur and it was televised event. And so they basically, there was like, had you declared for, had you already declared for the draft? No, this was after my freshman year. This is like, Oh, got it. Okay. This is like two weeks after we lost to Louisville in the national championship. Okay. Got it. So, um, yeah, they, and I'm, I wonder if now that would be allowed with like the NIL stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, so you know, who knows? I would, I would just go ahead and say that Steph would not be able to beat me in my own backyard just because it's, <laughs> you know, it's my backyard. Like I just know those rims. I know the wind, like I just have it all mapped out. Um, but obviously, you know, if we were to do a three point shootout on a regular court, I'm, I might have to go with Steph on that one. Mm. Uh, dude's the greatest shooter of all time. He, he redefined the three point shot just in terms of how far out you could go. He's, he's the king of the logo and all that, Mm -hmm. but I don't want to belabor that. Uh, you finally come in after two years. All right. You're the eighth pick a 29 win Sacramento team. I remember you said you had three coaches, Mike Malone, I guess he Mm -hmm. started out as the coach. And of course, uh, the, the coach now of the world champion Denver Nuggets. What was the transition like for you? That must have been crazy going through three coaches as a rookie. Yeah, it was pretty wild, um, especially coming from Michigan where like Coach Beeline had a very, you know, he ran a pretty tight ship, had things very organized and, um, you know, kind of set in stone. And it just felt like I couldn't um, I couldn't find my footing that rookie year. Like it was just things were constantly changing and, you know, I had like a different relationship with each coach. And then, you know, my role was different with each coach. And then by the end of the year, George Carl, by all-star break, George Carl came in. And I remember my agent called me over all-star break and he was like, Hey, you know, so George Carl is going to be the coach. And he goes, I don't, you know, don't take it personally. But he was like, George Carl doesn't play rookies. He was like, you're not going to play again. And I was like, I was like, what do you mean? He doesn't play rookies. He was like, I've had, you know, other players who have played for him and they just don't play as rookies. And then, you know, sure enough, we, I came back from all-star break and it was like the first eight games or something. I didn't first eight games. I like didn't play. And then this is actually a good story that I would love to share. The first time I did play for George Carl, we were in LA playing the Clippers and this was when it was lob city. Um, and we're down 30 points midway through the third quarter. And so I'm like on the bench starting to like get, get loose a little bit. Cause I'm like probably going to go in. And at the two minute mark, there's two minutes left in the third quarter. George looks down the bench, Nick, come in. So tearaways come off, run to the, to the scores table. I'm checking in and, um, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, who do you want me to check in for? And he goes, you know, get Ben Macklemore. And he was like, uh, you're going to guard Jamal Crawford. And so I like turned and I looked at where Jamal Crawford was. And Jamal was literally, again, Michigan guy. He was sitting there staring at me like, like I was, like I was about to be, you know, easy, easy pickings. And keep in mind, 
Jamal had like 20, 25 already full sweat. And I haven't stepped on the court yet this game. And so I'm like, Oh man, this is going to be rough. I check into the game first possession. They inbound to Jamal and um, you know, I look around me and all four other players are down on the baseline and Jamal is just dribbling, you know, 35, 40 feet out. And I'm like trying to get in a stance here, but I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit stiff. I've just been sitting for an hour and a half. And so sure enough, you know, he hits me with a little crossover, pull up three, bam. And long story short and, you know, next possession down, same thing, four down, pull up three, bam. And then holds for the last shot of the quarter on the third possession, four down again. And this time he just hit back to back threes. So I'm trying to press up on him a little bit and, you know, blew right by me, um, you know, goes to the rim and scores. And so he had eight points in two minutes and that was my first time playing for George Carl. And I was sitting, I go back to the bench <laughs> and I, and, and the, I'm just like, man, do I really belong here? Like it was one of those welcome to the NBA moments for me where I'm like, Ooh, this is not going to be as easy as I thought it was. Well, uh, it got a little more difficult in this respect. You came to Philadelphia and you played for a 10-win team. So let me flash back, July 2015. Uh, you're traded to a 76ers team that starts the year 0-18 and 1-30. and and It mm-hmm. had four double-digit losing streaks. It never won consecutive games. What was it like being a part of the process? Man, that was an interesting year to say the least. The only thing that I would say I took from it as a positive was I feel like the guys on that team, we were all very young. And so there, there was actually a great chemistry on that team um, from the point that we were all just starting our careers, early twenties, you know, some guys not even 20 years old yet, you know, all kind of trying to get our footing in the league. And so uh, we were able to, you know, make some good friendships and connections in that way that are still, you know, lasting to this day, which I'm grateful for. Um, but man, the, the day to day losing, that was unlike anything I've ever been a part of. And, um, at times just like super frustrating, um, especially for a guy like me who is like trying to, you know, prove himself in the league and get going it was hard for me mainly because like even when I would have a good game personally, you know, we would maybe lose by 15, 20, 25 points. And I would sit there and it's like, after the game, it's like, you can't even really celebrate or feel like you're improving in like personally, because there's always these big losses hanging over your head. And so that was like the hard part for me where I, it was like difficult for me to feel like I was making any kind of progress because at the end of the day, I'm like, we're just, we're getting killed out here. And, um, Mm -hmm. it, you know, I would say later on in the year, like post, uh, you know, you know, post new years, we started to string together again, you not consecutive wins, but we were starting to compete a little bit more. Yeah. We were a little more competitive. But man, that first two, three months of the year, it Mm -hmm, was mm -hmm. just abysmal. It was as bad as it gets. By the way, um, in that trade that brought you from SAC to the Sixers, the first round pick traded by SAC to the Sixers in that deal turned out to be Jason Tatum. And the first round pick the Sixers traded to SAC turned out to be De'Aaron Fox. I just thought I would throw that in. Anyway, next year, Joel Embiid finally plays. You go up to 28 wins. Did you think, uh, hey, you had maybe a future with this team? It, it was definitely promising. And I, I remember that year specifically after all-star break, we came back and I think we were like nine and two, nine and three in our first couple of weeks after all-star break. And, uh, and then Joel, um, I think Joel hurt his knee in the Houston game, which was, a uh, it was an ESPN game, I believe at home. Um, and it was, it was like the first time, the first like couple of weeks span where I was like, wait, we can, we can actually beat teams. Um, and teams had to like start taking us seriously because before that I could tell that teams would come in and play us and we would 
we could be up six, eight, 10 points coming into the fourth quarter because they were just not really playing. And then come fourth quarter, teams would, vets would turn on that switch and we would crumble, you know, so quickly. And a, and a 10 point lead would all of a sudden turn into being down by eight points in like a six minute span. And the amount of times mm. we did that throughout my first two years in Philly was, I mean, it was, it was gut wrenching. Um, but I guess those are the kinds of things you got to go through in order to, to learn and gain experience. But, um, yeah, once Joel, once Joel started playing, we definitely, one saw how special he was. And then two, um, you know, started saying, Oh, okay. This team, this team has some potential. Like there's, you know, there's, there's some room here to kind of, you know, make our way into the playoffs and, and get our footing, which eventually the team did. One night the Sixers are playing, you're in the game, it's in Toronto, you, I don't know, you go up like four feet and you slam a ball in off of a putback, and I mentioned your name, uh, and then I said, hold me back, fam! Do you remember <laughs> that? It's the first time I used that. I had it in my hip pocket, Scott Rigo, then the equipment manager gave it to me, and I just kind of held it. Uh, do you remember, the, you know seeing any texts in that regard or anything like that because i know that subsequent to that you would see me in the hallway at games you'd say hold me back fam and it became like a thing that you and i eventually yeah. did it was so fitting that you said it in toronto which is my hometown and fam is like a very it's very i wouldn't say it's toronto slang because people say fam everywhere but it very much is how people in toronto would speak hold me back fam like it's it was just mm-hmm. so fitting that you said it there in Toronto. Um, and strangely enough, I had four dunks that game. I'm like thinking mm. back to it. I had four dunks that game. I was just extra bouncy. And that putback was one of those ones. I think it was uh, Robert Covington shot a, a three from the left wing and I was in the right corner. And as he shot it, I started crashing from the weak side. And it was one of those things where it was like, I could tell the ball was going to bounce off the front of the rim and come to my side and I just kind of got that perfect angle on it for a nice putback. And then, you know, you made, it wasn't really the dunk. It was really your commentary that made the clip go viral on, on social media. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's when hold me back fan was born. And that became our little, that became our little thing. You mentioned being bouncy, Um, you know, being a white guy in a league that's dominated by, black guys is it uh i don't know do black guys come up to you is it become a topic of conversation do people say to you hey you get up good for a white guy does that ever enter into play yeah i mean it was it was always like oh you cut, you're like sneaky bouncy or like oh you can you can kind of jump a little bit i always i always got that a little bit um but yeah i guess it gave me a little bit a little bit more uh street cred um you know, when you're able to, you know, throw down some dunks, um, you know, I think that year I ha- I got a couple of good shot blockers on posters that year. I got Miles Turner on a poster and I got Bismack Biombo in uh, on a poster that same game in Toronto when you yelled, homie back fam. So I was like building some street cred that year for sure. There was one game where you did something in the game and somebody was watching with the subtitles on and I mentioned your name, Nick Stauskas. And for some reason, the voice recognition system didn't recognize Nick Stauskas and it came up with Sauce Castillo. Mm -hmm. And that became a thing for a while. Did you ever try to capitalize on that (laughs) With, with some kind of a product? I did have my own hot sauce, um, for, I think I remember that now for a couple of years. Um, yeah, it happened pretty quickly after, um, the nickname was born. I didn't really ever think the nickname was going to stick, but it, you know, people loved it. They thought it was the, I think the story of how it came about with it being a closed captioning error. Um, I think people really just latched onto that. But I mean, sauce is a cool name. Like it's a, it's, you know, once people were asking me, like, you, you, are you okay with sauce? I'm like, that's a pretty, I don't know if I'm going to get a better nickname than that. So I just, you know, I stuck with it, got a little hot sauce deal. Um, and then even now to this day, like when I'm in Philly walking down the street and someone says, hi, like no one says, 
yo, Nick, what's up? Like everyone's, yo, sauce, what's going on, man? How you do? And so it still <laughs> lives on to this day. Like I'm not in Philly, I'm, I'm sauce only. So what I, it's what I, you know, it's whatever the people want, but I'm, I'm all for it. 2017-18, the Sixers acquired J.J. Reddick, so playing time really dried up for you, understandably. Turned out to be a, you know, one of the greatest shooters in NBA history. Uh, mm-hmm. You get traded to Brooklyn with Jaleel Okafor. You play for Brooklyn, Portland, Cleveland. Then you go to Spain, and you encounter a coach in Spain that has a five-hour practice. And the quote from you is, this is why I'm never going to play in Europe again. Mm-hmm. A five-hour practice? What do you remember from that? My goodness, he, they're, they're, these, these guys are just built different over there in Europe. I just, their ideology is very different um, in terms of if you lose, it's always because you didn't work hard enough. And then it's like, you know, I'm going to show you tomorrow. Like when we get to practice, like we're going to punish you to like show you not to lose again. And so obviously in the NBA, it doesn't work like that. Like it's very much not like that. So, um, coming from the NBA to that was a little, it was a little hard for me to come to grips with. And then, you know, add on to the fact that that was really the starting point for me where I was starting to deal with some, uh, my left knee was really starting to bother me. And, you know, I don't know if it's, this is one of the ones like the chicken or the egg, like, was it because I was doing two a days mid season and having five hour practices? Like, I don't know, but it was the, the workload that we were doing over there was just unsustainable for what my current physical health was. And the, the issue that I had was that there was no wiggle room for like them to be like, Hey, we have a game tomorrow. So like, maybe you should take it easy the day before. If like you're dealing with this injury, it was like, no, 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 no. Let's ratchet it up because the reason your knees hurting is because you're not, you're not like in good enough shape. You need to like work harder and do more. (laughs) And so it was just like, man, I love basketball. Like, I don't know if there's many people that love basketball the way I do. Like I grew up playing six, seven, eight hours a day. I truly just love it. But that was the first time in my life where I, I sat there and I was like, I don't know if I love this. Like that was just, it was like right at the brink for me where I was like, this isn't what I enjoy doing if this is what it's going to look like. Um, and so, yeah, that why, that's why, again, for me, like, you know, we talked about why I stepped away from basketball and, you know, with the NBA being out of, you know, or kind of a a more difficult situation, I could have very easily said, man, let me continue playing in Europe and like make some more money for a couple more years. I very easily could have done it. But, um, is that something that I want to go back to like that kind of ideology and just honestly, like just craziness. Like it wasn't Mm. something that Mm. I was passionate about. So, um, you know, I, I tip my hat to all the guys that go over there and, and do it. Because it's it's definitely not as glamorous as the NBA may be in in some ways. So now you're retired from something that you were very passionate about, as you just described. Uh, what's next for you? What's the future hold? Well, interesting. Uh, interestingly enough, I would love to get into the broadcasting world, um, and I have a good amount of experience doing it. So, um, you know, I don't even know if you know, but during the process years, uh, in Philly, you know, obviously we weren't going to the playoffs. So come April, our season's over and now you don't resume playing until September or October. And so I was going back to Toronto, uh, as soon as our season was over and I would work for TSN, the Toronto sports network, and I would cover all the Raptors playoff games. And so, you know, over my NBA career, I ended up probably doing 40, 50 Raptors playoff games. And Mm. I loved it. Like it was, I would watch the games at home anyway. So, you know, why not go to the game and, you know, talk about it. And so, um, the more I did it, the more comfortable I got. And, um, you know, I never really took it seriously at the time because basketball was my playing career was still the focus, but I knew then and there that, 
after basketball was done, that was something that could be, um, a good path for me, uh, down the road. So, um, you know, this whole last year, I kind of wanted to, you know, lay low and just be here with my, with my newborn and, you know, figure out parent life and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, even looking forward to this next season, I have hopefully some things in the works where, um, I can, I can do some broadcasting gigs. So we'll see. You're from Toronto. You're living in the Philly area. Who's your NBA team? Be honest. Who's my NBA team? That's interesting. I don't even, I, yeah, I mean, no team in particular. I'm more so just, I love watching, love watching Steph, love watching LeBron still. Um, I'm more of like, just, you know, I like, I like to see a good matchup on TV, but I'm not necessarily rooting for anyone specifically hmm. anymore. Um, you watching the Sixers? I do. I watched it. I was at a number of uh, Sixers games this year. I was at the game. I went to the game where Joel won MVP this year. Um, you know, I, I love watching, I love watching Sixers games and I love that um, I go there and it's all love with Sixers fans now, which is crazy because Philly fans, they hate you when they're, when you're playing for them, then they love you after you're done playing for them. So. I wouldn't say that, that, that Sixer fans hated you. I, I, um, uh, I, I'm of a different notion perhaps than you are, but uh, since you watch the Sixers, uh, maybe you have an opinion on this. What do they have to do to win a title with Joel Embiid? <laughs> It's a good question. Um, man, it's just, it's just, I thought they had that Boston series. Like, it's just, I look back at that and like, man, I can't believe they weren't able to kind of, you know, pull through. Um, but they, I mean, I felt like if there was a year for them to do it, it was this last season. Like that was their, that was their chance to do it. And you know, now they've, they've lost a couple pieces in free agency and, you know, now they have all this, you know, drama with, with James and, you know, even Joel now a little bit. So I don't know, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't sit here and say that they would be my favorites to win in, in the East this year. But obviously when you have a player of Joel's talent, like you're always going to have a chance. Um, and by the way, he's just, he's unbelievable, Joel. Like I, you know, I, I mentioned I was at the game where he won MVP and I saw him afterwards and I just like, I gave him the biggest hug and I was like, dude, I'm so happy for you and proud of you. Like he has just come such a long way with his maturity, his, you know, his body, his mind, like everything kind of has like come together where it's like an unstoppable force. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm so happy for him that he's been able to kind of overcome the injuries and all the stuff early on in his career to get to that point where like, man, you're the best player in the world. Like you are MVP of the best basketball league in the world. Like it's truly a phenomenal story. So, um, I hope for, I hope for him and I hope for the city of Philadelphia that it can work out. I would just say that r coming into this season with like the storylines that are going on, I, I don't know if this is going to be the year for them, but Mm -hmm. Again, once when you have a guy like Joel, you know, reigning MVP, you you are you're always going to give yourself at least a chance. Nick Stauskas, it was a real pleasure, my friend. Even though you probably could have played a little bit longer, I agree with your priorities: being at home, being a husband, being a father. I wish you all the best being a broadcaster. I'm so happy you settled in the Philly area. We do love you here in spite of what it is that you may have thought while you were playing. Thank you so much for giving us your time. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate you. And um, yeah, it's all love. Hold me back, fam. <laughs>Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode of Fresh 24. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts.